A very good morning to all of you. Today's topic is going to be English Buddhism translations that misinterpret Pali Buddhism. Uh, so the reason why I uh, picked up uh, this topic is that uh, it is because there are huge amount of misunderstanding that uh, goes around uh, understanding about uh, the true Buddhist words not even the words but also the contextual meaning before we get started shall we respect to the Buddha sadhu 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 namo tasse bhagavato arehato samma sambuddhasse namo tasse bhagavato arehato samma sambuddhasse Namo tasse bhagavato arehato samma sambuddhasse. In the early, I think, 18th century, since uh, early 18th century, we have seen that there are lots of English translations that have been done for the Pali text. Now, do you know how it happened? How were the Buddhist texts going to the Europe? Any thoughts about it? Uh, if you are depending on those translations, then I think it is very good, important to learn how that happened. So how did they get the books? Because Europe, they didn't have the books, texts. You know that uh, Sri Lanka was colonized by many and the last to colonize was the British. It was in uh, almost uh, late 17th century. Uh, so different uh, people, I would say different uh, officers who uh, came to Sri Lanka to do their administrative work. Uh, they happened to visit certain temples and then they found out uh, uh, Pali, I would say all our manuscripts and then uh, it is said that some sold them secretly and then sometimes they were able to access because at that time at that time it was their country it's not it's not Sri, Sri Lanka uh, British Ceylon so they were able to bring them to uh, London and then what happened uh, they were able to translate these uh, uh, text Pali text into uh, English, that all Anglican English, not English. Uh, they say that they translated with the support of some local monks, uh, prominent monks at that time, but we are not sure how it worked. There was a language barrier that was between them, but somehow they say that they uh, consulted them in some ways. So one of the very famous individuals who uh, took part in this uh, uh, venture was uh, Rhys Davids and uh, his wife, Carolina uh, Davids. Now they are the ones who first started a society, what you, what you call by uh, Pali Tech Society. This Pali Tech Society was initially started in London and then they were trying to edit some of the uh, Pali, uh, I would say, manuscript that were in uh, Sinhalese and then Burmese and then uh, Siamese. Uh, so they kind of edited. They edited and saying that this is from the Siamese version, this is from the Burmese version, this is from the uh, Sinhalese version. But they made it in Romanized letters. So their edition was in Romanized. So I cannot say that it was a complete, I would say purified activity, but still it is good uh, because now we have a permanent selection of this Pali text. Um, on the other hand, we understand how they translated. They translated all these Nikayas. What are the Nikayas? Nikayas mean suttas. Then we have Vinayas, we have Abhidham, right? Uh, so they translated Sutta, Vinaya, Abhidham, most of the works of Sutta. 
most of the works of uh, Vinaya, most uh, some works of Abhidham, not exactly. Abhidham is a very bulky, uh, you know, number of books. Now the problem is that uh, when you are, now today we are trying to look at Buddhism, especially the uh, translation issues, English translation issues. In order for us to talk about this this spectrum, we have to understand whether do whether we have a systematized uh, set of text so far. Now they say the earliest uh, Ola manuscript that uh, researchers found out in Sri Lanka uh, was dated back to 13th century. And what happened to the uh, 5th century Ola manuscript? Eight centuries back, the Mahavihara, the Mahavihara uh, manuscript, they are not with us anymore. So we don't know what went uh, with them. Some people say uh, colonizers, they burnt, uh, and also uh, as a uh, common sense, we know that uh, all our manuscripts cannot be maintained uh, so long, maybe for many hundred years. Uh, or there were other dangers that uh, face, you know, I mean, manuscript f uh, face. Um, so uh, the problem here is that how do we understand the true Buddha's words? This is one big issue. Second is, how do we understand these translations? And third area is that, how do we understand the true Buddha's words as of now? There are lots of uh, tertiary, I would say, secondary literature, commentaries, Abhidhamma, uh, other Pali works, famous English works. They have been going everywhere. So where do we study the true Buddha's words? Uh, yesterday, I actually gave a talk at uh, Kindrara Metta Buddhist Society about Dhamma and Vinaya, how to understand Dhamma from Adhamma. Uh, this is kind of uh, connected to uh, this topic in a way. But we are particularly looking at certain texts today and certain words. First, how did the Buddha categorize, classify his teachings? What was his classification? Any thoughts? Did he say he has Tipitaka? Then where does this Tipitaka classification come into existence? Now you see every monk saying, every monks talk about we have Tipitaka in Pali tradition. They have written in many books we have Tipitaka, Sutta Pitaka, Vinaya Pitaka, Abhidhamma Pitaka. So how does this classification come into existence? This is a later classification. This is not the original Buddha's classification. The Buddha said, I only have Dhamma and Vinay. No Abhidhamma. But Abhidhamma was, was a uh, set of books which were actually uh, uh, made by uh, senior monks, but they attribute the authorship, ownership of the text to the Buddha. Now you see, there's another classification is that 84,000 Dhammas. 84,000. Have you ever heard that? Who said that? I have 84,000 Dhammas. It is also a later uh, addition. Later means not in the 15th century. Maybe first century, maybe uh, after 300 of, 100 years of Buddha's time. It is said that 82,000 were given by the Buddha and 2,000 were given by the monks, senior Arahant Sangha. So, uh, how do we understand these things? These were not given by the Buddha. Buddha said, I only have Dhamma and Vinaya. And then the monks were really confused about what would happen to them after uh, the Buddha passed away. Who is your successor? The Buddha said, no successor as a person. The successor will be Dhamma Vinaya themselves. Dhamma Vinaya themselves uh, will be the successor. Actually, the most important part is not Vinaya. The most important part is Dhamma. In order to protect Dhamma, there comes Vinaya. Because there was no Vinaya for 20 years. Uh, right? For the first 20 years, there was no Vinaya. Why was it? The people were already okay. Arhan Sangha, they were okay. But as many monks come into existence, 
as many people from different backgrounds come into existence. Then they appeared, there we saw lots of issues. Some were rich people, some were educated people. When all these people come into become a Sangha, then they had different, like what we experience today. Right? Although there is an access point for becoming a monk or a nun, uh, but if there is no, I would say, proper management about how to get them into the bhikkhu, bhikkhuni thing. Their previous nature of being an educa educated person or rich person or maybe administrator, those things will slowly immerse, assimilate into the Sangha or bhikkhuni practice. Right? Uh, that's why some people say maybe it's better to become a monk when they were small, so you have a proper training for many years, 10, 20 years. When, when you, are, like when you uh, bring up a child, uh, you know that when you uh, bring up child, raise child or children uh, from their small age, you can raise well, you know. But suddenly you read some books online and you are happy about the books and you became a monk. And uh, it is okay, but the problem is the training part. That, that spiritual, mental training part that might not happen as fast as they think, right? So there may be good individuals too, we never know, but there is a small issue. So then the pitaka, baskets, right? Pitaka is basket, right? Sutta basket, Vinaya basket, Abhidhamma basket, right? So they put all into the baskets. Well, this is an idea, a way that how senior Sangha might have uh, seen to preserve. So now, what we have to understand is that Buddha only talked about Dhamma and Vinaya. Vinaya was actually given after 20 years. That means he did not talk about Vinaya from his age 35 to 55. From 55 to 80, uh, till he passes away, the time he uh, it is said that he laid down some of the Vinay rules because these some of the monks did not respect actually there are issues in my reading there are a lot of issues now you remember the now the Vinay books say it's a it's a complicated idea the Vinay books say Buddha didn't have to make any rules he had no problems with the other monks fellow monks till he became 50, sorry, 55 years old. But if you see the sixth verse, I think the sixth one, huh? he spent at the Goshita Rama, he spent at the Goshita Rama. In that verse, there was a big problem came up, right? What was it? This was, you know, within his 10 years of, early 10 years of his time. So, uh, what happened was that he uh, encountered a big issue with uh, other fellow monks. Uh, there were two a group of monks actually who were formed. One was uh, Vinaya monks, one was uh, Dhamma monks. So they had an argument about the washroom. Some said it is good to leave some water in the bucket. Some said it is the person's responsibility. The Buddha said this is very trivial, you know, <laughs> about the washroom. Whoever wants to go to washroom, they may have their own way of doing things. But they said no. They said, uh, uh, if Dhammadara monk said something, Vinayadara monk said something else. That means he didn't have a very smooth kind of fellow monks, even his first couple of years too. But the Vinaya book says, no, Vinaya was not uh, important in the first 20 years. So there are some doctrinal, conf uh, what you call conflicts. Uh, if you look at uh, the text, I'm trying to see which vasa he spent uh, in this temple, so then you can understand. That means Vinaya was there, but the problem is he, that people don't understand that Dhamma is more important than Vinaya, because through Dhamma, you understand your Dhamma journey, you attain Sotapati and all that. Again, coming back to our topic. Now, Dhamma Vinaya is what we understand by the uh, true Buddhism. Then we have this classification. 
Sutta Abhinaya Abhidhamma. Oh, 84,000 or 2,000. Right? A lot of different other classifications. They were later uh, classifications. They were added by monks later at a different time. All right. Now, how do we look at this topic, English Buddhism? Now, I primarily say this is about uh, what we call um, translation issues. How do we see the translation issues? Do we have a translation problem with the Pali text into English? Yes, we do. Now, if you go to a very famous uh, translation site, uh, Sutta Central. A very good uh, uh, website uh, you know I mean he got the support of many other monks let's say if you go to one uh, let's go to a very minor version of the Sutta Kodaka Nikaya Kodaka Pata let's go to let's go to Metta Sutta it's pretty easy to understand ah, Metta Sutta and there are a couple of translations huh? there are three Six seven. There is no one translation, right? <laughs> and then if you click on here, this is the Burmese text. Maha Sanghi the Tipitaka Buddha say two thousand five hundred. They had two Sangha in Burma, Myanmar. And if you click on this drop down one, you see other translation. Africans, Arabic, Arabic, Arabish, then Deutsch, 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 Espanol, French. Hebrew, right? Dutch, Polish, Portuguese, Sinhala, okay, Tamil, I think Chinese, everything over there. If you click on them. So let's take the first English translation over here. Bhikkhu Sujato, the one who uh, made this site. All right. So before we jump into specific text, do we have a fundamental issue with the translations? Now we know Christianity is a religion, or uh, I don't know whether they might call it philosophy. So we have this branding. So in that branding, in that uh, saying of, in that calling of uh, saying that Buddhism is a philosophy or Buddhism is a religion, how do we understand? Is Buddhism a philosophy? Is Buddhism a religion? Let's start with that point. And then we slowly narrow down our conversation into text. Because they are also English words, right? Is Buddhism a philosophy? What is philosophy? The study of fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, existence, especially when considered as an academic discipline. A theory or attitude that acts as a guiding principle for behavior. Let's go for a more more academic one. Uh, philosophy means love of wisdom. In a broad sense, philosophy is an activity people undertake when they seek to understand fundamental truths about themselves. Fundamental truths. The world in which they live and their relationship to the world and to each other. This, this is very common to Theravada Buddhism too. As an academic discipline, philosophy is much the same. Those who study philosophy are perpetually engaged in asking, answering, and arguing for their answers to life. Most basic questions. To make such a pursuit more systematic, academic philosophy is traditionally div divided into major other areas of the study. In a broader sense, this is an activity people undertake when they seek to understand fundamental truths. Are we studying fundamental truths in Buddhism? What are the fundamental truths? Huh? All the aspects, we could say all the aspects. But the context of philosophy is not really touching the, the, the larger, broader sense of the Buddhist teachings. The whole context, you could uh, cherry, pick, cherry pick what you want. Right? Now there are people who might say, ah, environmental Buddhism. Is there an environmental Buddhism? Huh? Is there an environmental Buddhism? Yes, the word exists, but is there an environmental Buddhism? Buddha never talks about an environmental Buddhism. 
he has given his ideas about environment at different times so people call it environmental buddhism buddhist psychotherapy what is psychotherapy it is an experimental uh, psychotherapy is an exper uh, experiment experimentally based activity and it is always changing science is always changing and it is based on experiments yes uh, there are a lot of places where we see buddha has given his dhamma based on different people's psychological attitudes one example kisa gotami kisa gotami's uh, son passed away it was a very tragic death sudden death and then what happened she brought the son to the buddha asking only this primary question can you cure my son can you give give my son's life back the buddha said did buddha say your life is anich uh, he already passed away just go and bury the body you see these kind of things that you hear from some people in today's world right what did the buddha say yes i'm going to cure him she was very happy but on one condition go and find some mustard from a house where there are no dead people in the past but she was happy whatever the condition is she was happy she she ran carrying the dead body she's not mentally fit to understand what happened the buddha knew that because you you should talk dhamma to someone who is mentally fit otherwise nothing is going to work in that person's mind then she went from one house to the other house uh, was able to get a lot of mustard time to time she did not actually accept them final question is was there somebody who passed away in your household then they said yeah our grandmother grandfather maybe wife maybe husband somebody okay then i i think i'm not accepting your mustard then after going to many many houses she realized that this is a common condition this not only happened to me it's happened to many people it has already happened to many people like sometimes you compare you to other people's pain na see i have a back pain see my friend she is having a cancer how much pain she must be suffering na then you feel like oh, you, <laughs> you think about you feel a little bit good about it not try to think that other person is more suffering that can help and you are thinking lots of problems in your life but when you think about other people so many problems are going in their life i'm much better than them it gives you some solace some relief right appreciating your life appreciating your people around you appreciating your kalyana mitras appreciating what you've been having in your life right so the buddha the buddha's way of approaching kisa gotami work for her so that means uh, in buddhism we are not supposed to talk about this anicca dukkha anatta to everybody at all times we have to understand the situation the time the the mindset and then only we have to bring it in a certain different way maybe the same anicca what happened finally was she understood anicca but not in the first place in a, another way uh, remember um, what he gave to chula pantaka you know chula pantaka that little monk chula pantaka's uh, brother was maha pantaka he's arahant monk not a normal monk arahant monk he is the one who accept invitations from people at jetana ram when you invite the buddha for a dana he is the one who accepts asking other monks to go five monks to go for this area six monks for this area because at that time there were no that many house dhanas right so he said to his brother now you became a monk but you have to memorize one particular verse within a week of time we go maybe less than that but he could not memorize because there was a past bad karma that hit him the bad, the bad karma was that in a previous life he was a very smart genius student in the class very smart even before the teacher is writing he says the answers he knows what's going on 
But then he was mocking. He was making jokes about other students for their inability to be genius. See, you can't answer. I can answer. Because of that bad karma, other people were very embarrassed because they, they were not that genius. So they were thinking, what, what is going to us? So they were very much suffering. Because of that bad karma, in this life, as a monk, he was not able to memorize anything at all. Just a four-line stanza. You may also memorize that in a day or two, I think. But he could not. Then the Buddha knew this. Then uh, Arhan Mahapantaka said, you can't memorize a verse, you better disrobe. You can't be a monk. At that time you had to memorize a lot. There's no internet, anything, right? So one day morning he was very crying and then he decided he is going to go back to home. The Buddha saw this early in the morning. He has Mahakaruna. Early morning he is looking for uh, somebody to help. right? And then he found out him. Then he met him. Then he asked why you are leaving. Then he said, because my brother monk said, you better leave, you can't memorize. He said, it's okay. You don't have to memorize. <laughs> then he said, okay, I give you something to do. Take this cloth, white cloth, just rub it against, against your palms. And just experience that. And then the Buddha went for a dana by the noon time. So he kept rubbing it against. Then he got to see, because of the rubbing, the white cloth got dirty. Then he understood the change. You know the Patachara, I think Patachara, she became an Arahan just by seeing how the water fell down to the even place, from a higher place. Anicca. Even that small phenomenon can be a good object for Nibbana. Now think about it, you are going for many places to become nib attain Nibbana, but even a small phenomenon. Patachara just showed maybe a small water fountain. The water is cascading from the top and then she was, she was not just looking at the beauty side. When you see a waterfall, ah, so beautiful, wonderful, cascading water. Uh, take pictures. <laughs> but she was thinking, what's going on here? This water is falling, cascading to the bottom. See the changes. Now the beauty at the, at the, uh, the top and the beauty in the middle, beauty in the bottom, and then what is happening to the water? She's penetrating that process. She became an Arahan. That's why. So we don't need lots of objects. Some people are asking, give me an object, give me a bhavana. <laughs> give me a certain, I want to meditate. No, just the small things that are happening in your life. Since morning till evening, you, so how many things are going through? How many things you are uh, watching? You have not given enough proper attention. You only saw Manasikara to those phenomena. So that you miss, you lose all those precious moments and you look going for it. Maybe, uh, you know, another fixed idea that I want to go to the forest to do a meditation. But these people just became Arahan just by seeing normal things. Even you can become an Arahan one day, probably, by seeing a, an angry person, how he came up with the anger, how he was coming down, how he got back to normal. See his changes. And probably after one hour, he's a totally different person, very good person. After maybe another one hour, he can be changed again. All these changes. And Patachara, see how the Buddha approached Patachara. Uh, he was giving a Dhamma talk, Patachara came in, he was, she was naked. Uh, the reason was that uh, her husband passed away. Um, two sons uh, were uh, killed and then uh, mother father passed away. So she has no body. So she doesn't know even she wears something actually. So what happens to, if, if this happens to all of you, what will happen? Your, everybody is going away from you. Can you just hold on to life at that point? Because your whole world is dropping in front of you. What did the Buddha say? Did the Buddha say, hey, go away, this is a temple. You can't be so. He said, sister, be mindful. And she understood something going on. And people uh, threw some clothes. That's a different thing because they feel a little embar very embarrassed. But see the way how Buddha approach. So in that perspective, you, you can say there is a psychology, psychotherapy in Buddhism. But now people call uh, Buddhist psychotherapy. 
right? Environmental Buddhism. What are the other types of Buddhism that you have ever heard? Ah, business Buddhism. <laughs> See, business Buddhism. Yes, how do you call business? No, there is some business in here. There are some places where Buddha talks about bad businesses. You can't sell human beings, you can't sell animals, you can't sell drugs, you can't sell weapons. Yeah, so business, so business Buddhism. <laughs> the problem is the overall idea, because when you say business Buddhism, how, is, how do we understand it? So I think even religion, what is religion? Let's take a look at our religion. The fundamental, uh, I would say, definition. The belief in and worship of a superhuman power or powers, especially a god or gods. Is it relevant to Buddhism? I don't think so. We don't have a supernatural being. Buddha says he's a normal being, but extraordinary being. And we are not governed by the gods. I don't think religion is a proper word for Buddhism. Right? Even this ISM part, Buddhism, <laughs> it can also be a problem, you know. ISM, right? A distinctive practice system of philosophy, typically a political ideology or an artistic movement. Buddha's teaching, a way of life, a way of life. But the problem here is that even though these wordings are not suitable to the true Buddhist, the Buddha's teachings, but we, we have to use them. Otherwise, other people do not understand it. Uh, now, Buddhism is Buddhism an organized religion? It's not a religion already, but people call it organized religion. Is it an organized religion? Do we have one one leader, like the Pope for the Catholics? We don't have. Actually, Buddha himself did not want somebody like that. So, a lot of people think Dalai Lama is the uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama is the leader of Buddhism. It's not the leader. It's only for one particular branch of Tibet Buddhism. So, so we have to carefully understand these words in religion, philosophy, this environmental, uh, business, uh, psychotherapeutic, and all these types of things. It, they are okay if somebody wants to study as an academic discipline. But in our practitioner perspective, there is a problem. So with, uh, with saying that, now let's go to the translations part. What are the issues with the translation? Now, this is the Karaniya Metta Sutta's translation by uh, one scholarly monk. You see, Karaniya Matta Kusalena Yantang Santam Padang Abhisamecha Sakko Ujucha Sujucha Suvacho Chasamudu Anathamani. Now, let's do our translation the way how we perceive Pali. Okay, here we have. Those who are skilled in the meaning of scripture. Ah, now we find a word for what is scripture here? Do we have a scripture over here? Find it out. Do any of these words mean refer to any scripture? Karaniya Matta Kusalena Yantang Santam Padang Abhisamich. Where is the scripture here? Now see. Those who are skilled. Yes, Atta Kusalena. We can say it is skill. Atta Kusalena. Uh, those who are skilled in the meaning of scripture. In the meaning of scripture. I think <coughs> this is what he uh, uh, takes as the scripture. Santam Padang. Santam Padang. Is Santam Padang is a scripture? Huh? Santam Padang is not scripture. Santam Padang means the state of greatest happiness. Means Nibbana. How is it scripture? Now you will find one very big issue over in this translation. Ah, see, this person has translated state of peace. That's correct. Now let's go to the another one, another translation. Uh, Lawrence Kantipalu. He has translated a state, state of peacefulness. Yeah, much closer to that one, better. Let's go to this translation, 1987, State of Peace, ah, good. Let's go to another translation, Amaravati Sangha, Path of Peace, 
closer to that translation. Let's go to this translation done in 1989. Perfect state of perfect closer to that meaning. Let's go to the last one. This is a Sri Lankan monk. State of calm. A little closer to that. Now see the issue. I pinpointed a very small area of this. Right? I have initially translated uh, this first translation. All right. Those who are skilled in the meaning of, in the meaning of, is it in the meaning of scripture or in the state of peace? In the state of peace, then right? should practice like this so as to realize the state of, uh, he, has, he has given the state of peace <coughs> lately. But where is the scripture over here? Meaning of scripture. He has additionally added, maybe uh, he has added additionally the practice part. He has, he has brought scriptures to the practice. But we don't practice the text. Right? We don't practice the text. We understand the text so that we are creating our own practice out of it. Let them be able, upright, very upright, easy to speak to, gentle and humble. We will see this translation. First, let them be able. What is it? Sakko. Sakko. Sakko means able. Some translations go by skill. S K I W L. If you go to other translations, you could see. Ah, skillful. Ah, he also translates to be able. Another one. Able. Able. Yeah, should be able. Uh, but is sakko means able? What does sakko mean? Sakko means? Sakko means? Skilled. Skilled. Skilled in whatever the activity. Now you see kusala. What does kusala mean? Skilled. Skillful activity. <laughs> Not just the ability. Skillful activity. Kusala activity. A kusala activity is called unskillful activity. Skillful. Then sakko uju. Uju suju. What is uju? Here the translation is upright. This translation upright. Sorry, straight. Ah, this one is straight. What is straight? You know, struggling with this word. Ah. Sexual manifestation. Gay straight. You know, <laughs> well, what straight is this? Uh, sakko uju. Now this translation straight. This one so straight. Take another one. Upright. Uh, he has translated uju as upright, suju as straight. You see that difference. Then we'll see another translation. Maybe something here. He has translated uju as honest, suju as upright. Now see the issues. See these issues. So we have to understand these things. I'm not, we're not criticizing all these translators. They have done a very good job. But the problem is they affect our path. Because if you wrongly understand it. So sakko means skillful. Uju means upright. Yes, we have this word even in the uh, Sangha Vandana. Supatipanno, uh, Uju Patipanno. Uju Patipanno Bhagavatu. The Sangha of the Buddha, they are they have come down to the upright path, upright. Then, uju suju, suju means very upright. What is very upright? Upright, very upright. Here, this upright, maybe, how do we understand that? We normally understand this part as honesty. Uju suju. Honesty. Actually, our practice has to have lots of honesty. If you, if you are not doing well in your practice, you are cheating on yourself. Normally, you cheat on other, not you are, other people cheat on other people. But we are cheating on us. 
we have to be very honest it's a very it's the practice of the heart not the mind not the brain not the knowledge so honesty actually this uprightness is uh, described as moral uprightness you can be upright this way too right keep you back upright which uprightness is it moral uprightness what is moral uprightness let's say you have uh, patience right you have to be able to spread patience unconditionally let's say you you appreciate your loved ones for different good qualities are you able to appreciate them other people also for the same quality you pick on the wrong things of other people very fast but do you pick on the same stuff uh, from the loved ones so your morality should not be zigzag it has to be upright good is good done by even a janitor even somebody you don't know even anybody you don't like also if the bad was done by even a good person is bad even your loved ones even somebody else our morality should be upright so that means uju means moral uprightness and it was not translated properly that's a translation problem then suju means honesty this honesty comes from uh, not with not being corrupted in your mind alobado samoha right this honesty you know who you are right then uju cha suju cha suwacho a suwacho suwacho easy to speak to easy to speak to gentle in speech right this is suwacho actually means you are an easy person for other people's advices you have a uh, very uh, opening up nature for the good advices kalyana mitra said we are not going to do all the sutta i just wanted to highlight couple of places right and then suwacho mudu this translation goes by gentle this goes by meek this goes by meek let's take another translation too obedient right so what we should understand here we should understand what is the pali meaning mudu means you are flexible you are soft you are a soft hearted person right uh, right that is what we call by mudu you could say gentle too but the problem is how do we understand the pali meaning is that uh, mudu means uh, flexible basically uh, flexible you are able to be changed whenever necessary then anatimani let's stop at this place anatimani anatimani means humble in this translation without conceit then humble now this translation carries a problem why is it without conceit this is a problem why is it where do you overcome conceit in your spiritual practice you have 10 fetters sakkhaya ditti vichikicha silabbata paramasa kamaraga patiga ruparaga aruparaga mana you overcome man after becoming an anagami that means you have to be an arahant to practice these 15 skillful habits it means not conceit conceit will only be diminish only when you become an arahant this means humble just being humble you will still have man until you become an arahant because when you are sotapanna you are checking with other people ah, am i not a sakadagami yet i have to go to sakadagami i have to plan for sakadagami now when you sakadagami oh, maybe i am not anagami now compared to anagamins when you anagami i am not yet an arahant i have to be an arahant comparing you know you are trying to and conceit comes up maybe in a good way can come in a good way or bad way bad way is the bad thing so you can't say without conceit here right you can't say that only ruparaga aruparaga man uddha chavicha will be gone when you attain nibbana so in this way you have to now i want to emphasize learning sampali is very important now this is the problem 
I could do it for a couple of days. I just wanted to show you a little bit of what you can see here. Not disrespecting any of these translators. They have done what they know. <laughs> they, can't, they can't do whatever they don't know. Right? So, a little bit of Pali is important. That's why we are trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell you that learning uh, from the Pali way is better than learning uh, directly from English way. You will learn in, in English, but then try to understand whether this is the proper translation. All right, the time is almost up. So I'm going to then uh, bring up something very interesting at this point. What is it? Some of the basic words of Pali that have been highly misunderstood, mistranslated. One particular good word. Uh, is bodhi, b o d h i, right? Bodhi. What is bodhi? Now the usual translation for bodhi is enlightenment, isn't it? What is enlightenment? Go check. We never check these things, huh? Enlightenment. This is a philosophical word. It's an 18th century word. Uh, at the same time, people use enlightenment for many other uh, things. Let's say a violinist might say, I'm going to enlighten all of you with my violin today. I'm going to enlighten all of you with my piano, my guitar. So is it, is it enlightenment? Bodhi, 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 Vuchati, Chatusu, Maggesu, Jnana. Knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. Actually, what is bodhi? Bodhi means you are awakening from the sleep of all these kilesas. Because until you attain Nibbana, you are sleeping, not in the bed, in the sansar. <laughs> Buddhist means someone who is trying to awaken, awaken from that long sleep. Buddh, Buddh means to awaken. I will show you that. Bodhi start from the word called uh, Pali uh, word Buddh. I hope I can find it out. Pali uh, verb root. Yeah, you can see Buddh. Buddh to know. Uh, another word is Buddh to awaken. Only th there's only one meaning here. Buddh. That's the uh, verb stem. Awaken. So, better word could be awakening. Awakening. Karma. Now the dictionaries all have karma as karma. Then they talk about Hindu karma. What is Hindu karma? Every action is karma. That is Hindu version. Right? Whatever the things you do is karma. But Buddhist version of karma? Volitional action. Not action. Volitional action. Volitional action, not simple action. That means most of our actions are karmaless. So you think every every karma, every action is karma? It's it's a misunderstanding. Most of our actions are karmaless. Why is it? You might say that I was not mindful. That is why I I did that bad thing. That means. Now, two people are making karmaless actions. One is unenlightened people, one is by arahants. When arahants uh, offer flowers, meditate, no karmas are being generated. Karmaless. Uh, and most of your actions are karmaless. But don't take it as a way to uh, take things for granted. But because you are not intentional lot, volitional lot. But we are supposed to be volitional, then we can make a lot of good karmas. That means people can be only volitional when they do a good thing. Ah, now today I'm going to go to the Dhamma talk. My mind is good now. Ever since I came up with that idea, I'm making good karmas. But if you can uh, be volitional, a little bit mindful about your life, then you can create good karmas from being home, from being house. Why? What about that you are reflecting on a Dhamma talk you heard many years ago? You are reflecting about that Dhamma talk. Every moment you are reflecting, ah, good things I learn. I, this is how I have to practice. This is how I can consistently, you know, uh, maintain my practice. You are creating kusala. Right? That means you are doing the both. 
action at the same time reflection what are the other pali words now this is karma we call it volitional action not action what are the other pali words that uh, uh, there may be some misunderstandings anyone avicca what is the translation that was given by many avicca yes ignorance what could be the translation for uh, good translation for avicca better translation yeah literal translation is that vidya means knowing avidya means not knowing unknowing but sometimes we have to bring the contextual meaning going beyond the literal meaning to some people translate this to be unwisdom actually it's true because uh, avidya and panya the opposite is panya wisdom so unwisdom and the usual translation is ignorance but about what it is not given when you say unwisdom it it clarifies yes there is no wisdom about the four noble truths there is another word for this what is it i think i have mentioned in my sutta class moha moha are they same are they different meaning wise is this word familiar to all of you i think so moha m o h a what is moha avi yeah. normally they say delusion but how do we understand moha avicca and moha ha huh? stupidity yeah that is a bad translation you know that's why we we laugh you know <laughs> it it makes us laugh you know most probably a bad translation moha means the one life version of avicca one life version of avicca one life now we don't now we have ignorance we are rooted in ignorance that's why we are reborn we will be re, uh, reborning but in that particular life you are going through lot of mental states mostly akusalas so the ignorance will come to you pop up as moha so moha in that context means that you are deluded delusion so delusion and ignorance i would say avicca moha and avicca are two things moha is this life version avicca is the higher larger version of our uh, delusion i would say avicca uh, avicca basically means not knowing the four noble truths ah very good one samma samma what is samma Samma is equal. That is sama, not samma. <laughs> See, let me write that for you. It is called sama. That is a different one. Ah, huh? ah. You see, sama and sama they are two things. Now I remember that uh, one Sri Lankan monk was giving a dharma talk uh, in a European country, then uh, in Singhala, and then uh, there was only one Caucasian person. Uh, he doesn't understand anything about the dhamma talk this one given in singhala singhala temple you know sri lankan temple in london and then uh, finally uh, the monk was asking uh, ask questions and he said uh, because he heard this samma you know he said bante samma sleeping over here he said bante samma sleeping over here some devotees are sleeping in the audience because he had he heard from the monk samma aditi samma sankalpa samma vacha he thought samma means some ah <laughs> cuz he didn't understand it mante samma sleeping over here <laughs> so uh, samma is equal as you said equal if you are uh, uh, in a relationship buddha said you must have samma sadda samma sila samma chaga samma panya equal generosity equal sila equal panya then equal 
uh, uh, trust about the Buddha Dhamma Sangha at that place equal trust uh, uh, between each other. Samma is different. Samma means the usual translation is right. This is a problem. Now we also translate this to be right because popular notion is right. But is Samma right? Because some right things are wrong. Some right things are legal. I would say some, some uh, unwholesome things that we see in the world, they could be right. Somebody wants to uh, grab a gun and then go for hunting. It's right, you, can't, you can kill certain animals. But it's morally not right, isn't it? Euthanasia. Right? You can justify, somebody can justify that this particular person is suffering a lot. So he can or she can write, okay, kill me with a lethal injection. Right? So the, somebody might say, oh, the doctor is so compassionate, he is going to uh, accept that uh, thing and then he is going to inject. So both people are doing panatipata, asking someone to kill me, stabbing or taking life, giving authorization. And then somebody is coming and doing that. That is a Western concept, euthanasia. In Canada, we see that. Everywhere. In Canada, you can sign it. So in Buddhism, uh, it's a little un-Buddhist. Not un-Buddhist, it's very un-Buddhist. <laughs> it's a fundamental thing. Because you're looking at it from that culture itself. right? So some unwholesome actions can be right. So then, why do we put Samma to be right? We just go by the system. Right is what we know. But Samma cannot be right. Maybe you could say wholesome, wholesome view, wholesome intention. Wholesome, wholesome, wholesome. When it is wholesome, you can't do anything wrong out of it. Because in Buddhism, anywhere in Buddhism, what we see is wholesomeness, kusala nature. If you bypass the kusala nature and go to do anything else, then we have to deal with it with intention, volition. Samma cannot be right, but we usually take it. But there are issues. Any other uh, words? There are many words. Huh? You can. Uh, you could say harmonious, but sometimes you find harmony in unwholesome ways too. Harmony is not always ethical. It can be for an akusala purpose, not for a kusala purpose. But wholesome means kusala. It's exclusive. It's exclusive for kusala practice. But you could say harmony. You could say. But sometimes people are looking for peace. Ah, today I blame that person. I'm so happy, peaceful today. I left all my baggage onto that person. So harmony can go in both ways. But uh, uh, wholesomeness, you can't. Definitely you have to stay on to the practice. Could you give an example? Of how many well, harmony, people, harmony is a very popular word. I would say even in music. Uh, even in other things, people look for harmony in different. Let's let's find out the meaning. Huh? Now I'm saying harmony could not be always included with kusala aspects. Okay, I would say, internet has an issue, I would say harmony could be, harmony does not always entail kusala perspective. It may entail a kusala too. It may, because you don't necessarily add the kusala nature to harmony, necessarily. You can create a thought, yes, harmony means peace, you, you could say. But uh, there are may some, maybe some additions to elements of harmony at a certain point. But it is better to pick a word like wholesome because the wholesome is wholesome. You can't do anything wrong out of that practice. Better terming. So, uh, yeah, that's what I think about it. About knowing and understanding. Knowing and understanding. Jana to Yeah, so it's okay. But then knowing means a different type of knowing. Pasato also a different type of seeing. Because... Uh, yeah. You? Okay. What about this word 
Excellent, excellent happiness. Who said sadhu, sadhu, sadhu? No, when someone passed away, don't use sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Is that correct? I think you are saying sadhu at a certain point of the ceremony after chanting, right? Maybe um, expressing your uh, respect to the chanting, not not as a result of the death, I think. I don't think so, <laughs> right? I mean, let's say the bhantis are chanting and it's finished, you respect not not just putting your palms together, sadhu. That means happiness and respect to the sangha for doing that particular activity. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, they are referring to the death, sadness of the person. Yeah, it's kind of a very contextual one. In Sri Lanka, it happens now. Some monks are, uh, you know, teaching about Devadatta's uh, thrown in the stone. Now devotees, Devadatta threw stones at the Buddha. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> what is sadhu in the throw in the stone to the Buddha? Because they say in Sri Lanka there's a tradition. Every time they say somebody says Buddha, they say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> but the problem is, at that point, the monk said Devadatta threw that big stone to the Buddha. Why do you say sadhu for that? <laughs> Every time there is a mention Buddha, Buddha, sadhu, sadhu. That means you have to understand where are you are going to sadhu at. Otherwise you're going to be you're becoming a joker, you know. <laughs> at that point it is clear, you know. But for a funeral, I think I, I, I never think that devotees are saying sadhu to uh, something about the death. Yes. Back to the Metta Sutta. Mm. There's this line where the mother protects the child. Mm. I can never understand those two. Ah, the, the bigger meaning. Mm. Mata, yatha, niyam, puttang, ayusa, eka, puttam. What's the meaning of that? Just as a mother protects her only one son, we all are supposed to um, spread loving kindness, metta, to others. What does it mean? How much love does a mother uh, have? For, his, for her only one son. I think it's a huge amount of love. Uh, so, uh, Buddha asking us to think about that level of uh, the, what you call the filial piety, the filial love towards the son, and then learn from it and then bring and then spread the same amount of metta, that is a person, personal love, the filial one. Now, the metta is an unconditional one. You don't have greed about it. So learn from that mother that amount of, not the way, huh? the way is very selfish, it could be selfish because mother uh, is particularly giving attention to her son, her son, that is why she is doing that. But we are not taking that way, we are taking how much love she is giving to that son, that how much, this how much nature has to uh, be a common ground in our uh, metta practice. Because normally when, you, when some people practice metta, they do it better to their people and lesser to the other people. It depends on how much they know. So I think we have to uh, bring metta to everybody. Otherwise you are not going to uh, make that practice properly. It's a structured practice. Make sense? That's, that's how the simile works. We don't take, you might be sort of puzzled why it is the same way as a mother does to a son. Not the way. A way could be a little selfish. She has to be so, <laughs> right? But the amount of love she is giving to the son is unconditional love to the son. Whatever happens, she is giving to the son. Only one son. And that nature has to be inculcated, I would say, incorporated into our metta practice. We will take one more question because I got to leave for an event. Yeah. Yes, yes. Dhamma, D H A M M A. Right? How many meanings does Dhamma have? Huh? So, in the context of uh, Samma Iti, Samma Samhita, how would we actually look at it? Yeah. Now, uh, Samma means the perfect, fully. Yeah, fully, perfect. Actually, the contextual meaning is that uh, a Bodhisattva becomes self awakened. So that is we call as the perfect Samma. Samma at that point means perfect. Some people translate Samma to be perfect also. And uh, Samma, 
under the normal eightfold path just means wholesome to our understanding because not only the bodhisattva is going through that we normal individuals also go through this samma all right so uh, i think it's better to uh, wrap this up at this point if you have any more questions please ask me maybe uh, any time other time maybe you can join our sutta study uh, yeah always welcome sadhu 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 may all the good karmas which uh, we've been accumulating today be transferred to many individuals over here late brother james meditation group chia chi moon and family uh, liang muk suk and family lim su ha kwa hui hok and kwa chi siang chan sien sit anybody who passed away in uh, these families and all the departed ones who passed away in the name of all of us be able to receive all these good karmas may they be well and happy may they attain the supreme bliss of nibbana sadhu 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 may devanaga mahidika also share all these good karmas may they be well and happy may they protect and bless all of us all of you for good health, quality of life, and prosperity. May Devanaga Mahidika also attain the supreme bliss of Nippar. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Finally, uh, before we uh, make our last wish at this point, may we be in the company of the Kalyanamitas all the time uh, to um, continue, maintain our spiritual practice while thinking and wishing may all the good karmas which we've been accumulating today be support you and helpful for all of us to attain the supreme bliss of nippan sadhu 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 abhivadana silis nichang vadha pacha inu chattaru dhamma vadhanti ayuvannu sukhang balam ayura rogya sampatti sakka sampatti me vacha ato nibbana sampatti iminati saminjatu sadhu 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 I'm wishing you a good day ahead of your time and then seeing you then maybe tomorrow, maybe next Sunday.